Welcome to The Friday Habit with Mark Labriola and Benjamin Manley. The Friday Habit is for small business owners, freelancers, and creatives who are ready to take their business to the next level. Join us as we discover how to apply the strategies we learn to grow our businesses, make more money, and live every day like it's Friday. All right, and welcome to The Friday Habit. Today I'm writing solo. Ben is on his journey to the West, so he won't be with us today, but I'm here holding down the fort. And I'm excited for our guest uh, today because he talks a lot about employee satisfaction and business growth through great leadership. And so I think he's going to offer a lot of good conversation and education to us on today's show. So Today, we have Chris Moroff on the show. He is a CEO and founder, author, and serial entrepreneur who helps professionals find fulfillment in their work through sustainable success. He started his first company, MSB Consulting, in 2011 and later ventured into venture capital, uh, owning startups in various industries across Austin and Maine. And he's an author, and he's got some great books. So, Chris, welcome to The Friday Habit. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. So, hey, uh, how's how's it in Austin? You're in Austin right now, right? I'm actually uh, up in my uh, place in Maine right now. Okay. All right. So it's way uh, too hot to be in Austin this time of year. <laughs> that's true. It's like 110 and just yes, miserable. Yes. So Maine's, I'm sure, a lot more uh, pleasant. So tell me a little bit about that. Like you have these two places you're living, Maine and Austin. Uh, why is that? Is that where you grew up or did you grow up in, in these two places? So I grew up in New England, um, just north of Boston, uh, about 40 minutes north of the city. But from there, we would uh, vacation uh, with my grandparents up in Maine. Um, and then within the last probably 25 years, um, uh, part of one of the businesses that we had in Maine was traveling all over to school districts. And we kind of ran into this very remote area of Maine. And so we're not just in like remote Maine, we're in remote, remote Maine. Um, <laughs> there's no, no people, no tourism. It's this tiny little town that is really dependent on agriculture, and that's where we've been coming up for the last 27 years for vacations and with my kids. And so my wife and I decided to settle here half the year um, in order to really kind of uh, help out the town. Um, And so we do a lot with employment, uh, work experience here, and then uh, we spend the rest of the summer, I mean, the rest of the year when it's uh, nice and cool uh, back in uh, Austin. Yeah, Austin is a very cool city. Um, yes, it's and it's. I feel like it's really just popped over the past several years. It really um, has. Yeah, I have a cousin of mine. Uh, he got a job down in. Uh, I'm based out of Denver here, and um, he got a job uh, several years ago at Oracle, and they have a big yeah. campus out there. And so we road trip down, and I help him get all settled in, and um, you know, it was, it was a fun time, but you know, seeing it then, you know, we kind of toured around and, and, and did some stuff. And then I feel like since 2020, it's really just started to skyrocket as far as its growth and stuff. It's gotten so big. We've, we keep moving North. So we are, um, uh, in Austin and we moved to a suburb and now we're in a town that doesn't even like to be associated with Austin. <laughs> so yeah. Um, uh, but we're still basically in the Metro area. Okay, nice. And where are we going for, uh, for barbecue, like Cooper's or, Blacks or, I mean, <laughs> I mean, blacks is always a good choice. You know, it's funny going, uh, moving there from New England, I'm just not a connoisseur. And so I love all their barbecue. <laughs> like I go to the place and I'm no like, this was barbecue. amazing. <laughs> yeah. And the, everybody with me, like who's from Austin, they're like, that was terrible. I'm like, what? It's all, <laughs> it's wonderful to me. So, yeah. I, I remember the first time I went, I went to, uh, for South by Southwest, uh, for, you know, some tech conferences and stuff like that and, and doing some things over there. This was maybe back in 20, 15 or 16 something like that and uh it was it was funny because everyone was like you got to go to franklin's you know franklin's is like the place yeah and so i went i got there maybe at like 8 30 or 9 in the morning and there was just a line all the way out the door huge like, so i was like okay cool i'm gonna be like this is gonna be an experience and i'll be like in the in crowd once i get in well 
around like 10 30 or so, like this guy comes out and he counts, he's like counting all the people leading up to me and he gets to the person right in front of me. And he's like, Oh all my right, gosh, the barbecue we have for today. Everybody else go home. And I was like, no, you're done. Yeah. Yeah. So I called up an Uber and then the Uber guy is like, Oh, I know this place better than Franklin's. It's just Franklin's is, you know, got the hype. So he took me to this other place it. and then I, I was very satisfied and not disappointed. He, yep. That's like me. We go to a place called Rudy's, which is all over, but it's in a gas station and I love it. <laughs> but, but again, my coworkers are like, that is pathetic. I, I get either. it, but it's delicious. Yeah. Yeah. I think barbecue is one of those things where it's, it's all levels of, of it's kind of like Mexican food. I would say it's like, yeah, there's just levels of good, you know, that's like, right. Yeah. Some is better, but you know what? I get down with the, the Taco Bell taco that's right. burrito taco and that's still delicious. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm not that picky. I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, that's, well, that's great. That sounds like a good, a good life you're living then you, you've built. Yeah. Your we, nice, we love it. <laughs> a little, we love it. Um, system. best of both worlds. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the, out here in Colorado, obviously the goal is always like to get like some sort of mountain home, you know? So it's like you, you live in the city and then you go up into yeah. the mountains and, and it's so beautiful here and there's so much stuff to do. We're constantly, yeah. you know, going on adventures and just staying in our town because it's just so great. And, and it's funny because so Ben, Ben is from Lynchburg, Virginia, and he owns an agency that does, um, uh, website development. And then I'm here in Denver and, uh, you know, we do content creation. So podcasting, video production and photography, and uh, he's on a road trip heading west. So he was actually here last week and we got to hang out and spend some time together in person um, because, you know, every, every other time it's just usual virtual virtual. And we usually get together like once a year in person um, and he comes out here to the mountains. But this time he got to bring his whole family and it was, it was nice. Great. Yeah. So do you, do you make it to Colorado at all or love Colorado? In fact, uh, uh, years ago, one of the uh, areas that we kind of de- deployed our our company was in colorado we were in the that northeast in fact i had all the school districts um from loveland uh all the way to the nebraska border so uh, i think it's i-70 the whole yeah. the whole way out um were all my school districts up there and then my parents had a log cabin down in durango oh yeah okay. um and so i spent a lot of time in colorado i absolutely love it yeah durango is beautiful too it gets a bad rap because it's kind of so far to get to but you know, yeah. going down there, it's, we, last year we spent 4th of July. Every year we try to go on a trip to be gone during 4th of July and went to Durango last year and Silver, uh, Silverton and all that kind of stuff. It's just so awesome. Um, but this year we're going to, uh, we're gonna go to Yellowstone. So I haven't been to Yellowstone. Oh yeah. You'll love it. Gorgeous. Yeah. So, well, Hey man, um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your story because your bio sounds so impressive. You know, it's like owning all these company venture capital, like, yeah, but I'm sure that you were just a normal guy at some point, just trying to make yeah. a way in this world. And I would love to hear kind of a little bit about that journey and, you know, how you kind of got into business. What were some of your skills and things that you used to yeah. level your life up? And then, you know, I'd love to go further into, you know, workplace alignment and, you know, your four pillars of success uh, for successful leadership and all these other kind of things. But I really want to start with your origin story and kind of hear a yeah. little bit about that journey that got to where you are. Yeah, the it's great. And the first phase I like to call kind of your uh, critiquing period. And that's when I worked for my parents for 15 years and started with them when I was 22. Uh, they had both come off of industry jobs. My mom in education, my dad in, in technology, uh, to start a business in the area of consulting in K-12. And um, I joined them. I had uh, dropped out of college. I'm like, that's not for me. Not really uh, sure what I wanted to do. I was selling cars at the time. Okay. And they offered me this job, um, which was stability. And I wasn't feeling super great about who I was in the selling of cars. And so... Like, yeah, it, it, I was living in South Carolina at the time. And so they said, well, you'd move back to New England. And I'm like, yeah, let me, I, I can't wait to get out of here. Uh, no offense, South Carolina. But <laughs> I was like, I just wasn't. Humidity, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. It's hard. So moved back in 96 at 22 to work with my parents. And we did that for 15 years, some highs and some lows. But what I learned in that process was that, uh, you know, my parents as parents, were phenomenal. I, I claim I have parent privilege in that they really raised me with this this feeling like, hey, I have intrinsic value and it won't matter 
you know, what grades I got, what sports I played or, you know, what instrument I played. It, it wasn't superficial. It was really instilling in me that I have an incredible amount of value as a human being. Mm. Fast forward to working for them. And all of a sudden it was just different. It wasn't terrible. It was just different. They really showed up in a very command and control style, like generational leadership. Mm. And I had a hard time understanding what my value was in that process. Um, because on days that I, you know, sold a, a contract, sold to a school district, I had a huge amount of value to them. Mm. Days that I didn't, I didn't know or understand what my value was. And so during that period, just really confusing uh, for me to understand, like, how to win at work. Like, how do I find success when the target seems to be at, be a, a bit subjective or this, this moving target? That's definitely, I, I feel like that's one of those things that a lot of, I would say a lot of entrepreneurs and people that I know uh, who are creatives, they kind of struggle with this, right? It's like this idea of yeah. when people like what I do, I feel good about myself and I'm winning and I'm you know confident. And then when I get negative feedback or I don't hear anything, then I'm really self-critical and I'm depressed and I'm you know, right. <laughs> feeling worthless. Yeah. And uh, I know for me, it was one of those things that took me into my mid thirties to kind of figure that out and realize that, wow, that's not really healthy to allow other people to dictate the value that I feel in myself, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The pr it's this uh, industrial age um, that ushered in this <clears throat> mindset that your value at work was in your productivity. And so it's just hard to overcome that. Like you said, it can take a long time to really understand that that you just have intrinsic value for being, not just for doing. And so that was hard for me. Um, it was hard to really understand uh, how to win. And for me, winning is unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, everything. Um, I expect to win. Um, I, you know, somebody asked me one at one point, do I, do I love to win or do I hate to lose? Well, I, I hate to lose because I expect to win. And so at work, I just couldn't find that, that moment or these moments weren't long enough for me to feel like, yeah, I'm, I am living out my value, um, in a very tangible way. And so that was, uh, you know, so what do you do in that situation? What do I do? I spend a lot of time critiquing, critiquing my parents, critiquing and just being, yeah, just a little bit kind of like, uh, well, I'm not in their shoes, but I can, I can kind of guess maybe in my mind what it would be like to be in their shoes. And then you play this, I did at least this month or this kind of reel that goes around and around and around, which is if I had my own company, I would just do it better. I would just do it differently. And so, um, finally got my opportunity in 2011, um, to move to Texas, move to Austin, uh, from new England. And I bought a few contracts, uh, from my parents to launch out on my own, on my own, not realizing what I had wished for, not realizing <laughs> the, the storm that was brewing right. and kind of, uh, you know, having to eat all my words of critique and, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's easy until you're the one who's in charge, you know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Wait a second. Yeah. Yeah. So I moved there with chip on my shoulder and <clears throat> was there probably about a month in Austin before I kind of really fully realized, I, I feel like I just got kicked out of my family business. Hmm. Um, we were in a tough place, uh, emotionally and, uh, financially, uh, my parents had stepped away for a little while. The business was doing great. And then uh, we had regulatory change um, in the industry that we're in that really crippled uh, a big portion of our business. My parents stepped back in. It was just friction all the time. And that's when my dad was like, Hey, would you be, you know, would you be excited about buying some of these contracts? So again, they did it very well, very loving. I I'm super glad that it happened because I got them back as parents. Uh, but at the end of the day was asked, Hey, this probably isn't for you. And so do you want to buy these contracts? And so, yeah, I launched down on my own in 2011. The first four years there, it was just this blissful, ignorant, like slogging through, uh, grind, uh, to figure out how to, uh, run a business that's, that's cash flow positive. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's for me, it's just, it wasn't an easy, like I wake up in the morning, I'm like, I know exactly what to do. It's this trial and error, you know, for that first four years. The one thing I did do was really try to create a framework by which my employees could understand how to win. Mm. 
we really tried to be fully aligned organizationally from top to bottom uh, by putting everyone on the exact same page. In fact, the first book that I wrote really talks about that is organizational, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, unity and making sure that everybody understands what they're doing, why they're doing it and how they can win uh, at work. And so that's really what I focused on those first four years. And in that time, it was very client centric. Uh, everything we did was uh, really to let the client win. And what I didn't realize was happening during that time is as the company did, thankfully, find a lot of success financially because of sheer willpower and dumb luck. Um, those two things put together can uh, make an amazing company. But what I woke up realizing four years in after I had found financial success and I had, uh, you know, how you, I don't know if you, but for me, I've, I've got like in my mind's eye, at least like a list of like metrics. Okay. You know, by this age, I'm going to have this or, you know, mm -hmm. with my business, I had a whole laid out in my mind. Yeah. Year one, this was going to be my revenue year two, year three, I had it all laid out. Well, I blew away all four years worth of metrics that I mm -hmm. had, had originally um, thought about came to those end of those four years. And my best friend who had started this with me resigned suddenly. Huh. And it sent me absolutely reeling. I struggled to understand what I did wrong since I really intended to create an organization by which he understood how to win. Come to find out he had been looking for the last nine years and it really had nothing to do with me. He really was called into another uh, vocation uh, back into uh, ministry work had nothing to do with being dissatisfied or unhappy, but still, yeah, but still didn't want to bring me along on the journey. Huh, and yeah. I didn't understand why I'm like, dude, I'm your best friend. Like, why wouldn't you have like told me I, I would have supported you. I would have been all for you. But he, he said something that really kind of struck deep and he says, I don't know how you would have reacted. Hmm. He says, I think I've seen that when other people aren't viewed as useful by you, you move on quickly. Mm. And he says, I just didn't want that. I didn't want to lose, you know, ironically, I didn't want to lose this friendship. And it hit me uh, pretty hard in that moment that running a company being very client focused left my employees kind of lacking a little bit of this idea of fulfillment mm. um, because I, I was more interested in my clients than I was really my, my employees. And so that was the day that I kind of switched focus from being more client centric to being more employee centric uh, mm -hmm. going forward. It was a, it was a tough pill to swallow for sure. What, uh, have, have you ever heard of the Enneagram? Yes. Uh, what, do you know what your number is? I mean, probably, right? I do. I am an Enneagram eight. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's that blinders, like leadership, like just drive and like win. <laughs> yes. At all costs. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and you know, this idea, but you know, even back then I would say like the Enneagram disc, we, we, we took, I don't know how many tests I, I abhorred like eights, all eights do any of that stuff, anything mm -hmm. that feels like it's going to control me, restrict me or put me in a box. It's like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to go and take these tests yeah. and learn about myself in this way. I'm pretty self-aware, right. at least I'd convince myself. And so I'm like, no, I reject all of those things. Um, ironically, now the Enneagram is a big part of my counseling and consulting that we do for small businesses yeah. um, because it really helps translate behavior mm -hmm. uh, not only for yourself, but your employees as well. So yeah, it was a tough pill to swallow. I, uh, I'm a big fan of, of the Enneagram, not to really pigeonhole people or put them in a box and say, oh, this is who you are. But it, especially as a leader, for me to understand how best they are motivated and then how that's right to most effectively communicate to them. And so typically I have everybody do the Enneagram. You know, I have at the Enneagram Institute, you can actually get like business licenses essentially and like send tests and then it keeps yes. the scores and stuff. So you know, I've, I've, uh, been able to do that. And, and really I started that because in my own personal life, several years ago, my wife and I, you know, we were going on 19 years of marriage in October, Congrats. but for years, you know, we got married super young. So it was like, we didn't know who we were. And then it was like this constant, like struggle, you know, of, of like, yeah. Oh, who are you? And like, why are you being this way? And like, just change, you know? And then we had a friend who turned us onto the Enneagram and it was like this light bulb went off where it's like, Oh, like, you're wired this way. And yeah, I've been fighting this uphill battle and really I need to figure out how to best communicate to you so that I can use your, 
you know, things that I thought as negative as like superpowers, you know? That's right. <laughs> so it's exactly. Like, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan uh, of the Enneagram. And if you're listening and you don't know what that is, just Google it. And uh, there's a lot of great free tests out there that you can take. And yeah. it's, it's a fun rabbit hole to go down. And there's just a lot of great things about it that I think does differently than other tests like the discs and things like that. I feel like what's great about the Enneagram is that there's this element of we're all healthy and unhealthy within That's right. minutes, you know, like we're, we're flowing in this healthy and unhealthy state. Exactly. And then when you can recognize, okay, how do I behave or what are, how am I acting when I'm unhealthy and how I'm acting when I am healthy? Then it's like, you can almost start to see into the matrix and then figure out like, okay, how do I be the best ver- version of myself? You know? And you so, got it. Yeah. It's a very similar story on how I got into it. My wife and my wife's the one who got me into it. And we got married super young, 18 and 19. And, uh, literally like don't speak the same language at all what like i wife? i don't my wife and i yeah no no what, what it's is like, her number oh she's an enneagram four okay okay yeah okay the arts like you know just yeah, she and i are the most passionate numbers <laughs> yeah and so fireworks every time i'm like what is happening <laughs> or uh, i remember most of my life walking around looking at every other human being this is terrible to admit but i <laughs> my constant thought in my mind is like what is wrong with you <laughs> Like, why would you do that? <laughs> and I didn't understand that this, these are coping mechanisms. Mm-hmm. And that um, that's what I love about the Enneagram is it really, it doesn't put you in a box, but it just shows you the box that you put yourself in. And then the beauty uh, of it to me is it shows you how to get out. Right. Um, and so it's it served me really, really well to understand, like you said, the motivation um, behind what people are doing. I call it the great translator. It just helps translate. Uh, behavior so that I can now see other people's behavior in a new light. Um, and it really provides a lot of understanding as opposed to just straight up judgment, which for an Enneagram eight is so unfortunately easy. <laughs> it's know. like, One what is wrong with you? Eight, you know, and it is just yeah. like, <laughs> his wife is just constantly like, he's just so mean. And like, he just said what he <laughs> thinks constantly. And like, you know, I'm like, listen, that's just, that's just my buddy, you know, Lukey. Is- <laughs> yeah. I, I say that I'm a recovering eight hole. <laughs> yeah, nice, that's good. Yeah. So uh, learning how to learning how to exhibit healthy um, uh, attributes of an eight and uh, trying to put away the uh, the unhealthy for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. And then what? You're like a seven wing or something like that. You like seven wing. Oh yeah, love to have fun. Yeah, like to have a good time and things like that. Like to have a good time. Yep. Yeah, that's all. And you know, it's fortunate for you that you're from New England because you got you know you had Brady for a quarterback, so it's like you're always winning, and it's just like, yeah, I live in the best area <laughs> for like twenty years. Yeah. I feel like we're going to be in sports purgatory for the next twenty. But yeah, that's okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Got to join the ranks of like the Browns and the Bengals or something. Because <laughs> that's right. It's like I used to hate yes. Brady so much, you know. Especially being, a, you know, we're here in Denver, the Elway and Manning. You know, it's like, yeah. And it was one of those things where it's like after he kept winning, it was almost like you can't not just respect the guy, you know, for the exactly. game. Yeah, like, it's some that's point right. you just have to be like, all right, dude, like you're the goat. Like <laughs> I it's can't pretty impressive. You. you got yeah. the rings, you know. It's not just that's- all talk. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's that's um, that's that's good. Good for you. Well, so yeah. okay, so so you, you your best friend just bounces on you and kind of out of the yeah. blue, and you're like, okay, like I better look at things differently because this kind of shocked me a little bit. And it wasn't right away. You know, it's like these moments in time. Now that <clears throat> when I go tell the story, it's like uh, things happen faster in the story, but in reality, it just seemed like it was an eternity. So this was the end of 2014. He put in his resignation early of uh, early 2015. I was meeting with a guy weekly. One of the things that I'm, I was trying to do on this journey at the time was trying to figure out with my wife, this idea of empathy and growing up in new England, it's just kind of a, especially for a guy, I think it's this, this suck it up, man up. I remember being told as a kid, so many times, dry it up. Like I'm not allowed to cry. Yeah. And so. Yeah, you know, but my poor wife for years when she would bring me something or talk to me about what she's feeling, I'm literally trying to help her by fixing it and mm. explaining why her emotions are unnecessary. It's basically yeah. what I'm doing. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I wanted to I, I wanted to not do that to her anymore. And so I was meeting with this guy every every week to really go through this uh, concept of empathy. And so he met with me. He could tell I'm off and and um, he asked me how I'm doing. And my answer was either fine, good or okay. 
Uh, but really, I'm not going to answer that question because my definition of being a man, a leader, um, is this strong, confident problem solver that's there to take care of everyone. Like I'm here to take care of people. And being an Enneagram 8, I have a very overactive paternal instinct that tries to just make sure that everybody's okay. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of being weak or like bringing people along in, in what's going on inside, it just wasn't on the, on the cards for me, in the cards for me. So he asked me that question. And of course I ignored like I normally do. And by the end though, he's like, Hey, I want you to just ask yourself this question. Who on this planet would you share your deepest hurts or fears with? And of course I lied and I'm like, well, I got my wife, I've got my friends and there's no way I'm going to tell them my deepest fears. Mm. I won't even confront my deepest fears, let alone <laughs> like admit that to somebody or talk about the hurt that I was feeling that my best mm. friend left. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about, I can talk about it, but I'm not going to talk right. about what I yeah, need be to be vulnerable. talking about. You're not going to open yourself up to, you know, look like you have a chink in your armor, right? You're, you're no. Not, yeah. No. And that would be, a, in my mind, um, the false narrative was that would be a disservice to everybody that I'm supposed to take care of. Hmm. Like I'd be flipping the script on these people where now they have to take care of me. That just didn't seem like a good, reasonable, responsible thing uh, to do. So on the way home, I'm in my car and I convert all emotion into anger. Mm. Um, every emotion goes right to my safe space, which is, again, false narrative is to control the situation by being really angry. And so I'm in my car and I'm angry at uh, my, this guy I'm meeting with weekly. I'm, I'm angry at my family. I'm angry at my best friend, Jason, for leaving. Finally, end being very angry with myself. And I, I remember the realization that I literally was in a prison of my own making because I'm just refusing to be vulnerable. Like there, there is a, there is a decision being made that if I let people see the weakest, messiest part of who I am, the scared little boy that exists every single day at work, every single day at home, if they actually see that they'll run, mm. they'll run for the hills and they won't, they won't think I'm worth loving mm. if I were to expose any of that. And so at uh, 42 years of age on that on that car ride home i just and i weep now thinking about it i just wept for the first time as an adult i cried the whole way home and i just realized i am so alone i am so emotionally alone and i think that a lot of business leaders i know a lot of guys maybe get to this place of just like man i can't let anybody see that i've got these scars i've got these these hurts these fears because i need to be strong but the alternative is just utter loneliness. And um, I never realized that. I never, never dawned on me or hit me until that moment. Uh, yeah. And I think too, it's this idea. I know for me, it's what's hard is, is that <sighs> there's a sense of nobody understands what I'm going through. Like even my closest friends don't have a business, you know, they work for somebody. Right. And so it's like, yeah, there's this element of like, I can share with you about how I'm struggling to like fire this person or whatever. But I mean, you don't even understand like the weight that that like puts on me, you know? So there's even like, okay, I can share, but then there's, there's no, um, yeah. like, reciprocation of understanding and, and like feeling like, oh, okay, wow. Like you understand, you know, I think that's one thing I love about Ben, you know, and, and him and I, um, you know, been friends for several years and we actually met through, I hired his company when I was working at another company, I hired his company to make our website. And that's how we met back in you know 2014. And, uh, and then that's just been one of the most cherished relationships I have, even though he lives in, you know, Lynchburg, Virginia, but us yeah. together with this show and being able to talk and, you know, just being able to share with somebody who actually also is going through some of the same things. It's is, huge. Yeah. It's, it's really, you know, shared, uh, yeah. Shared experiences are uh, an incredibly powerful way yet yeah, to understand, um, the, really the truth of your situation, um, in a, you know, in a, with that outside perspective is just everything. Yeah. Um, so that's awesome that you have that. Yeah, it's 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 a blessing, but then it's still one of those things where it's. I think for me, it's a, still a constant struggle. Um, yeah, and, and it's funny actually because you know I'm coming to your conference uh, in October. Oh, um, cool! When I started doing research, uh, you know, on you uh, for this show, you know, several weeks ago, I, I I was like seeing everything that you're doing and all that kind of stuff, and I saw your conference, and I was like, man, this sounds like right up my alley of like you know trying to find community and you know other people who are you know, 
kind of in the grind with you and, and just trying to get that encouragement. Cause that's what's, I think the hardest part is like, you're trying to yeah, self motivate your every day. It's like you wake up and you know, like you said, it's like, you're, you're trying to be the leader for everybody around you and you don't, you don't want to let anyone down. And so it's like, even when things are tough, you, you're just trying to like, you know, white knuckle it and, and, uh, <laughs> you know, wake up every day yeah. and make things happen. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. So I think that's very important. And I think a lot of, you know, especially men leaders, you know, it's like, they don't want to appear weak and they don't want to, um, you know, right. be vulnerable, but, um, I think there's something, there's some, there's some power in that, you know, I think when we can let our guards down and be vulnerable with other people and, um, I think a lot of healing can take place in that, in that space. That's right. All right. We're going to pause this conversation here. Uh, you go to the Friday habit.com. There you can find show notes for this episode. Uh, there you can also find links to our websites and ways to get in touch. At the bottom of the page, you can download our guide to the Friday Habit System that will show you how to set aside one full day each week dedicated to working on your business instead of in your business. If you're not already, make sure you subscribe. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode and want to hear next week's episode, subscribe so you get notified. Uh, also, leave us a review in Apple Podcast app uh, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you want to potentially be on one of our episodes uh, with a question you ask us, go ahead and record a quick message in your phone, voice memo, and email it to hello at the Friday Habit.com. Until next time, live every day like it's Friday. <laughs>